In this episode of the Hill Country Podcast, I visit with the Museum of Western Art Director Daryl Beecham about our joint love of the music of Michael Martin Murphy, the current exhibit at the museum, and the upcoming 40th anniversary exhibit. I know you'll enjoy this episode of the Hill Country Podcast. And we're rolling. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and we're going to have a lot of fun today because I have back with me one of my favorite people anyway, Daryl Beecham, Executive Director, Western Museum of Art. But we're going to talk about art in a little different direction, perhaps. Daryl, first of all, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. So, Daryl, uh, we're going to celebrate your relationship with uh, one of the great musicians uh, in Texas and in the United States, Michael Martin Murphy. So could you tell us who he is and what's the story behind you guys? Uh, working together. Well, I mean, my relationship with Michael Murphy started back in uh, high school, actually, when I went to, I, I became a big fan of, you know, some of his early work, Geronimo's Cadillac, things like that. And um, he was doing a concert in Bell County, Texas, right? And then um, I got wind that he was going to be at a local uh, record shop and he was going to be signing autographs, right? He was going to go by there and sign autographs. So I, I got in line like a dutiful, you know, a fan should do. And uh, I bought the, and I didn't have the money to buy it, but I bought the uh, Michael Murphy Blue Sky Night Thunder album, which is right there, and had him autograph it back when he was just Michael Murphy, right? I mean, uh, the story would go that later he would go out to Hollywood and uh, uh, want to start in films and he went to register for SAG, the Screen Actors Guild, and they said, we already have a Michael Murphy. You have to change your name. And he said, well, can I just add my middle name? And that became Michael Martin Murphy. And the 3M logo was born at that point, if you will. But uh, this was a case of, uh, you know, a high school kid who really enjoyed a, a, a performer and went and, you know, tracked him down and got an autograph on an album that I still have, what is it, 40 some odd years later, you know. And so... Um, Got on with my life, you know, enjoyed his music like a lot of people and uh, became a museum director. And throughout my museum career, uh, he has been one that has always kind of favored museums. And he has always uh, uh, been known for doing concerts in smaller towns uh, like here in Kerrville. He does the uh, Cowboy Christmas every year. He takes that uh, Cowboy Christmas uh, tour usually, you know, around the country and does them in a lot of same places. And oftentimes he visits the same city, you know, every year. He, it's, it's on a routine for him. And I was the director of a museum in Montana, and we uh, were able to fortunate enough to host him as a, uh, a concert, a little mini concert, working with the local symphony is what he usually does. And um, we hosted a little benefit, uh, benefit thing for one of the local charities, and I don't even remember who it was. And uh, I didn't really, I got to meet him and say hi. And, you know, it was, that was pretty much the end of it. It was one of those, hey, I, I've got an autograph record of yours from 1976, you know. Oh, hey, that's great, you know, thumbs up kind of a thing. And um, we forgot all about it. And then I went to Hobbs, New Mexico, and was in Hobbs um, for eight years. And uh, he was associated with a, a ministry out there, out, actually out in Lubbock, Texas, a homeless ministry, because uh, Michael lives in, in, in New Mexico. And uh, he was associated with this uh, um, home ministry. And we hosted a, a concert at our museum to do a benefit, a small concert for 200 people in our theater there at the, at the museum. And so he came on board and uh, we came early and we actually set up the, you know, the, the equipment and the roadies got it all ready. And he was doing an acoustic, just him kind of thing. And he... Um, he hated everything about it. He hated the sound, the way it was sounding. He hated the lighting, the way it was lit. He just didn't like the intimacy of the theater. And he just complained and complained and complained. And I told him, just chill. This was going to be fine. We have good light people, good sound people. And we worked it all out. And he, he did his little uh, you know, uh, sound checks, if you will, and got it over there. And then that evening, he did a, a, just a bang-up job of a, of a little concert uh, for the people. And it was so well-received, and it was so good. And he came up to me later and apologized that uh, he had ridden me so hard that, that day. And I reminded him, you know, we've met before. We have. I said, yeah, we met and, you know, uh, when I was a kid in high school, when I was a museum director in Montana, 
and this is our third meeting, you know, um, and I've never once asked you for your autograph other than on the record. And I was in a line of people. And uh, he said, well, why don't we just get a picture? Let's get a picture made. And so I thought, well, how's that going to you know, get me an autograph? But we took the picture and we took this picture here when I was in uh, um, Hobbs, New Mexico, of, of me and Murph standing there. And I handed it to my assistant and she immediately printed it. Right? I mean, you could do that. I mean, that was better than a quick photo, you know. And uh, she printed it, and we brought one, brought it out to him, and he signed for me the the uh, autograph here, uh, you know, for the American West, Michael Martin Murphy with the little three M logo there, and that's me about thirty pounds ago. But anyway, he, uh, um, that's kind of we got to know each other, right? That evening between the concert, there was going to be a dinner, uh, there was going to be a gathering, there was going to be an auction, and one of the things they were going to be auctioning off was a Michael Martin Murphy guitar where he had written the lyrics to wildfire around the, the base of the guitar. And the uh, uh, group had hoped to auction the guitar, um, you know, and get a certain amount of money for it. And it, it wasn't going well. Uh, and so one of my benefactors was sitting there kind of next to me and she said, well, I'd like one. And I said, you know, run it up you know make it happen and she finally let the lady who ended up buying it uh, have it at a reasonable price and then she said but i'll also take one and she gave a price out there that was you know just phenomenal and of course murphy said i'll do you one and for making the second one happen and, and basically tripling the money that they were going to get uh his manager a fellow named Bert madera looked over at me and said, and I'll get you one for making that happen. And I thought, no, you know, that's, that's okay. It's not going to happen. Um, and I forgot all about it. And, uh, um, you know, it was promised a, a Michael Martin Murphy guitar signed by Michael Murphy. And, uh, you know, I forgot all about it. I moved to Kerrville and was in my office one day when a, a guy named Bill Dante, and I don't know if you don't ever interviewed Bill, but you should, because he's, he's great. Bill runs the, uh, he's the chairman of the board for the Texas Rangers Foundation, the former Texas Ranger Foundation over in Fredericksburg. He's a former weatherman for the San Antonio weather, you know, stations over there. And uh, he was in my office. He now runs a magazine called the Texan Magazine, he and his wife, Lisa. And they're absolutely spectacular. It's a great magazine, by the way. It goes to a lot of, you know, really the people I want to reach with my clientele at the Museum of Western Art. And this was sitting, uh, this was hung on the wall. And he said, he was looking at all my, you know, my stuff, you know, the degrees and all that crap. And he, you know, Murph? And I said, well, yeah, I know Murph. And I told him that story that I said, and by the way, that sucker owes me a guitar. And uh, he said, well, why didn't he ever get it to you? And I said, well, his manager that had promised me one of the guitars, Bert Madera, passed away before COVID, right as COVID was starting, and just never told Michael about it. So here I was thinking I was going to get guitar, but Bird had not communicated to, to Michael. And Bill said, Michael's a friend of mine. I'm going to make it happen. And I said, oh, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. And a year went by, and, and uh, uh, Bill came back into my office. He saw the picture again, and he said, oh, man, I, I was going to talk to Michael about getting you a guitar. You know, he's doing a concert for us over at a fundraiser over in New Braunfels. Why don't you come by? And, you know, I said, well, I'd, I'd love to do it. And then I ended up getting COVID. And I couldn't go over to the concert. And so Michael was going to come to Kerrville and do a, a benefit concert. And we were all going to sit down and have dinner together. Bill, Dante, and his wife, me and my wife. And Michael ended up getting sick. I don't know if it was COVID, but he had the flu or something. And so we had to cancel. Two weeks later, when they had rescheduled it, I was out of town. I had to be in Dallas that weekend, so I couldn't make it. The following Monday, Bill Dante walks into my office with a case that has, he said, I've got something for you. And he said, Michael remembered that he owed me a guitar. And one of the reasons we were going to get together was so he could give me my own version of the uh, Michael Martin Murphy autographed guitar with the lyrics to Wildfire written on it. Let me see if I can reach around here and get that. So for those of you listening, and, what Daryl has literally is a Markle, Mark, Michael Martin signed 
guitar with the lyrics to Wildfire written around the side of it. Yeah, this uh, is a, this is a Yamaha 350 uh, 335 guitar. It's made out of wood and plastic and a little metal, and it's you know it's of the modern era, if you will. And as a museum person, I've always got to say that you know that's what it's made of. Just a, a pretty standard you know guitar. But what's really cool about it, it's got the words Wildfire written right in the center, signed by Michael Martin Murphy. It's got this 3M logo. And then over here on the, I think it's the left side or somewhere, it starts off with the lyrics. You know, she comes down from Yellow Mountain on a dark, flat, you know, land she rides on a pony she named Wildfire with a whirlwind by her side. And it goes on and does the, you know, there's a hoot owl howling outside my window and all the, the great, you know, the great lyrics. And he does these around, you know, the, the, the you know, around the edge of the guitar. What's fascinating to me is that uh, I've been doing this with him for, for 20 something years now, or been a part of him watching him off auction off the guitars. And honestly, his handwriting has gotten worse and worse and worse. <laughs> when, when I first one I ever saw it was very clear and distinct and you could read all of the words. And uh, this one came through the door and, and you know, it, you can tell he's, he's, you know, he, he's writing it out and he's not, his penmanship's not as good, but um, Bill Dante came in the door and he said, uh, I've got something for you. And he takes his guitar out and he said, Michael, sorry that he missed you, you know, because that was one of the things he wanted to do was uh, give me the guitar. And uh, I don't know if Michael actually said it, but Bill, Bill said, Michael said, this ought to shut him up. <laughs> yeah, so. What? so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a special little mem, you know, memento of a relationship of a, a kind of a secondary relationship with a you know with a, with a famous person and so i always thought that was pretty cool so we've had it out on display at the museum and people seem to really enjoy it and, um you know i'll try treasure it because it is really pretty something special let me ask you what did either the song wildfire or the album blue sky night thunder mean to you when well, you were a senior in high school because yeah, i was a you freshman know, in college yeah you know, we had great music Right. I mean, my generation screwed up a lot of things, but we got the music right, you know, and guys like Michael Murphy, uh, you know, John Denver, the Eagles, uh, you know, that era, uh, Chicago bread. I mean, the whole group, uh, you know, they, they knew how to do music. Music meant something, you know, it wasn't just a bunch of, you know, three words repeated over and over with head banging music. Right. I mean, it was, it was lyrical. It was mystical. And, you know, and, and Michael's got a, you know, tremendous voice. He still does. And he's a tremendous guitar player. Um, and he spoke to an entire generation of, you know, a, a storyteller. And I was in the Western genre, if you will, you know, as an art major and, and was hoping one day to go into the museum world in the Western art field. And he was of that Western, you know, Western uh, genre. A lot of people don't realize that some of these greats, you know, you think about George Strait and, and all those guys, their albums, they don't have just one hit song on them. You know, there's 10 songs and there's nine hit songs. On them, right. I mean, the albums are packed today. I think, you know, a lot of these artists are, are putting out albums and they're lucky if they get, you know, average a half a hit song out of every album. You know, it's Here, and, and he had, you know, he had 10, 10 hit songs, you know, on Blue Sky Night Thunder. There's Carolina in the Pines. I mean, think about that. That's one of those great uh, uh, medicine man and, and night thunder rings of life are all classic, you know. And for, for me, it was the Western genre. It was the, the white man honoring the Native American. And, he, you know, that's what he sang about. So, so what uh, can you say a few words about? No, actually, you can't say a few words about anything. <laughs> but could you say uh, a little bit about the Cowboys song? writer the cowboy singer and what that meant in the west yeah i mean you know everything we're doing is storytelling right i mean the the museum of western art in kerrville um it's all we do is storytell right and for me the cowboy poets uh guys like baxter black and and uh, uh, they 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 tell stories and so their lyrics in michael's case um you know they're little mini movies if you will they're little mini dramas um the, you know the one that immediately comes to mind is willie nelson's uh, shotgun willie you know or red-headed strangers even a better example 
they made an entire movie about the album Redheaded Stranger, right? I mean, it's 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 one story, one song leads to another, right? And it it pieces together a narrative that you know tells the story of the American West. The American West, for the most part, um, is not a long period of time. I mean, it's it is and it isn't. It goes, it dates back centuries uh, with Native Americans, but we think about the um, the trail drives, they lasted three years, and yet they become a permanent part of, you know, of, of our society, right? The, the stagecoach, uh, there probably wasn't, you know, 250 stagecoach runs across the country in the entire existence of the stagecoach, and yet it's a major part of what we think of about when we talk about the American West. Uh, you know, the shootout at the OK Corral lasted nine seconds, and yet it's lasted for 150 years, right? I mean, so the American West is all about telling stories and that's what Michael does and Willie and George Strait and all those guys through through their lyrics. Let me change the focus a little bit because I, want, I wanted to visit with you about the current exhibit at the museum. Uh, it's nearing its end, but when I saw it, uh, I think in November or December for the first time, I was really awestruck and it, it seemed to me to be the most personal exhibit, and it turned out it was. Can you explain <laughs> what the exhibit was and why it was so personal? Yeah, you know, so many of what we do, so much of what we do, we plan so far in advance, we have to have things really worked out. Um, we're planning, for example, a Billy Shank exhibition that starts in July, and we've been working on it for three years. I mean, we know every work that's going to be in it and where they're going to hang and, I mean, all, all that. You know, we've got the 40th anniversary show that's coming up you know, in April, and we've been planning it for two years, right? That particular show, the one that's currently up, uh, we call it Works We Love. And I, quite honestly, had dropped the ball and not really put together much thought into what we were going to have from between November and April, because I was so concentrating on the 40th anniversary that's coming up in April. I was concentrating on Billy Shank. I was concentrating on the 40th roundup in the fall. Uh, we're even doing something with Shriner University to celebrate their 100th this year. You know, I'm working two and three years in advance, and quite honestly, um, the November to November 22 to, to April 23 time slot, slot kind of just escaped me. I hadn't given it much thought. I knew we were going to put up permanent work, work from our permanent collection, but I hadn't thought about what. And then one day it hit me, why don't we let the people choose? Why don't we let our docents, our volunteers, our... Um, our guests, you know, come in and, and we say to them, what's your favorite work in this exhibit, you know, in, in our collection? And invite them back to the vault and let them go through the works and say, God, I'd love to see that. And, and in some cases, works that we had not given a second thought to in years, right? Because we've got, you know, a thousand works that we're dealing with. And sometimes uh, things get kind of pushed aside and we don't put them out. And I pulled this little, you know, one of our, our docents said, God, I just absolutely love this little piece here. Look at this. It took it out under light. And I just went, oh, where has that been? You know, incredible. And we put it out and sure enough, it's been a big hit, you know. So we, we call it Works We Love. Um, and it was very personal because you can tell there's been a lot of people who, uh, they, they have a reason for that work to be out. It doesn't make a lot of sense, honestly, um, you know, as far as, as thematic approach goes, you know, we do have one room that's all cows. We, you know, we said so we were able to do that. And we were able to pull, um, several people pulled Fred Harmon's works out, his works they loved. And that got us to thinking, Fred Harmon, gosh, we've got a lot of Fred Harmon works. Why do we have a lot of Fred Harmon's works? Well, he was a founder of the CA, Cowboy Artist of America. And um, we were gifted years ago a, a great collection of his works. But then we got to thinking, you know what, in the archives, we've got cartoons, we've got some of his cartoon strips, we've got original cells. Let's pull all of those together. So we created Fred Harmon and, you know, Red Rider and Little Beaver and put those in a separate room. And so it just kind of evolved into, you know, what do they say, even a blind squirrel can find an acorn every once in a while. We were, we were fortunate enough to find a really good acorn in that mess of things. So, yeah, kind of personal. But I hadn't really thought about it in that way, but yeah. That's, that's really what I felt, and I felt like there was a docent next to me explaining why this was <laughs> one of their 
favorite pieces in the Fred and I tell you what you can. You can go, I, I selected that and they put it on the wall, you know. You know, the Fred Harmon room uh, was my childhood. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, so I got to sort of see that and things I hadn't seen in years. So uh, it was incredibly personal. And, and just remember thinking this, this feels very different. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was a lot of fun putting it together. Once we, we settled on that idea um, and we started inviting people back to the ball, find their words, they got excited. Right. You know, where's that? And they would, you know, it was the funniest thing they would say. Now, I, I don't know the title of it and I don't know who painted it, but how am I going to find it if you don't know the title? And then they start describing it. It's a, it's a man on a white horse and he's got his hand up and, you know, and he's looking, you know, kind of out. Ah, it's called looking for the wagon train, you know, by Joe Beaver. And we pull it. Is this the one? Yep. That's it. That's the one. I love that painting. You know, it hadn't been out for years. Well, we've got a study that goes with it. So let's pull the study and put it out there. You know, and some of the ones they, they pulled, they, <clears throat> they, um, we have out a lot, right? I mean, some of the favorites are the favorites because they're so great. Buck McCain's The Invocation and Roy Anderson's In the Rainbow TV and, you know, Robert Pommel's uh, piece called A Ways to Go. Those are people's favorites for reasons because they're, they're absolutely great, great, great. But we, we were able to pull some things that uh, hadn't been out in years because people, uh, you know, it was there kind of spoke to them for a reason. And, and the didactic information that we put up, we'd, uh, we'd ask them, why is this your favorite? And the comments, you know, that are there, you know, we put the little cards beside it. This was chosen by, you know, our docent, Judy Ward, or, you know, and, well, I like this because, you know, this speaks to me at, you know, at a level. They remember it. They have a story about it. You know, they, they, that, that scene is a scene from their history. And so it made it very personal. And could you just tease us a little bit with uh, the next exhibit? Yeah, I mean, talk about a great exhibit. My goodness. Um, we're putting together a show called 40 Years of Western Art. Uh, and it is uh, representative of the last 40 years. Museum of Western Art opened in 1983. So this is our 40th anniversary. And um, I put together a list of, um, I started writing one day the list of people I, I was influenced by. The, the impactors, if you will, you know, those artists that we needed to have at a show to say, these are the, the impact people of the last 40 years. <coughs> Excuse me. And they all include, you know, include people like Robert Pommel, who's a Kerrville area artist. They include Roy Anderson. And I mean, you could go through the list. And then I got to thinking, but you know, Andy Thomas in Missouri was impactful in the Western art movement. Of course, it's got to include Howard Turtning and Ron Riddick and I started making this list, and when I got through, it was 200 names. I got, I can't put 200 works up, right? So I have to, have to kind of start getting a little more critical. Okay, so what made them impactful? It made me think through the whole process of the people that I think are the impact people of the last 40 years. And I got the list down to about 85, 85 names. And we have invited those 85 people, if they're living, to get us a painting or a sculpture that represents them. That when somebody walks up, they go, my God, that's a Ron Riddick. Or that's a Jack Sorensen, or that's a T.D. Kelsey. I want people to walk up, and if they know the Western art world, they walk up and go, wow, that's a Howard Turk. And so I started calling around. Uh, obviously, those who have passed, we either had to borrow from collectors or we have them in our collection. And the show is about 50-50. Works from our permanent collection and works that we had borrowed from other museums, collectors, or uh, gotten them directly from the artist. So if they were dead, I borrowed them from a collector or a, a museum. And if they were living, I reached out to them and I said, I need to borrow a work. Now, they could go out to a collector and find it, or they could reach out to the museum and help me find it. Or, or they could say, in, in like a couple of cases, I'll just send you one. Right. I've got one in my personal collection that I think represents me really well. So we're going to have some works that have never been seen before. Um, uh, Howard Turpening, for example, is probably the, the most famous of all of the, they considering the dean of the Western art movement. And Howard, um, uh, Howard's works will sell for a million dollars. You know, he was one of the first. That's why he's in this show is because he's an impact player, right? He was one of the first guys to break that barrier. Western art has not always been in the same genre as fine art. If you will, they don't, you know, a lot of the 
critics have never included the Charlie Russells and Frederick Remington's um, in, in the Western art genre. But Howard was one of the first people to say, listen, this is serious art. And we know it because people are willing to pay a million dollars for it. So I started calling around to collectors I knew who had Howard Turpnings and museums and nobody would lend me one, right? Because honestly, they don't want it to be on the road. They don't want it to be in a, a, a going down a highway at 80 miles an hour, right? I mean, even though we've got it highly insured and we're you know using the best couriers in the country, uh, everybody was saying, no, I can't do that. So I pick up the phone and called Howard and I said, I've got a problem. And he said, just the one? I said, well, right at the moment. And I told him, I said, nobody's willing to lend to me a Howard Turpin painting. He said, well, I'll love you one. You know, and we made arrangements to get it here. And it's, it's a piece called He's My Horse Now. And uh, it's never been seen. It's in his personal collection. And uh, it's a smaller piece, small-ish piece compared to some of the great, great big ones. Uh, but it, it is, it's going to be a, a collection of 85 works of the best of the best. Now, did I get it completely right? I'm going to tell you right now, I did not, right? I have left people out, and I promise you I'm going to get my hands slapped. There are people going to walk up and say, well, how come such and such is not in this show? And the only thing I could think of was, you remember Casey Kasem? You bet. The radio disc jockey? America's somebody top said, 40. Yeah, somebody said, how do, how do you, you know, select the, the best of a given year? And he said, it's my radio station, right? My ball, my bat, right? And so for this show, I'm going to take the credit or I'm going to take the blame, you know, and there's going to be some, some blame. There's going to be some people. When people get to thinking like I did, they're going to say, well, how come Morris Ripple's not in this show? And I'm going to say, well, he deserves to be in this show, but A, I could not find a single person who would lend me one, right? Or B, the works I could find, I didn't think represented him well enough. Can I suggest so, a response to that? So, yeah. Let's have a conversation. Yeah, let's let's talk about it. Let's right? talk about it. You know, we're going to do a podcast. We'll start a podcast. Thanks to you guys here on the Hill Country, you know, podcast. Um, we are network. We're, we're going to do a, a, a call. It's art. Let's talk about it. Let's have that conversation. And uh, it's great. So we're, you know, we're excited about it. 85 works and like I say, 50, 50 uh, deceased people versus living and 50, 50 from our permanent collection and, and borrowed from others. But man, Jerry George, I mean, people just don't get to see his work. And we've got a fabulous one coming from a local collector. Um, you know, Robert Pummel, Howard Turpening, Ron Riddick, um, Clark Hewlings, you know, uh, Clark Hewlings is probably one of the all time greats great great greats um one of the superstars and we just we don't own one in our personal collection so i pick up the phone and i called his daughter and she said sadly daryl i don't even own one right i mean if they're that rare to see um but he, she said let me call a couple of collectors and, I, and, and a collector from tulsa oklahoma called me and we're going up in a couple of weeks and we're gonna take a transport you know truck up there and we're gonna get this painting and bring it up bring it back it's going to be a rare, rare chance to see 85 of the greats in one location. Daryl, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time for this episode. But before we leave, if our listeners wanted more information on the Museum of Western Art, where can they go? Really quick, museumofwesternart.com. Uh, museumofwesternart.com. Um, and our, our website is brand new. Uh, can't say enough good things about it. It's, it looks fabulous. There's uh, pictures and schedules and contact information and uh, everything about what you need to know how to get there ticket prices when the show's open uh, all out there we're already uh planned our page we're going to start teasing our podcast next week so right yeah we're gonna start telling people about the podcast and we'll we'll be able to start promoting that but yeah museum of western art and uh, uh you know come see us at 1550 bandera highway Kerrville, texas daryl thanks so much and i look forward to continuing this conversation always a pleasure let's talk about it let's talk about it this is Tom Fox again. Thanks so much for listening to the award-winning Hill Country Podcast. I hope you'll join us again for another episode. The Hill Country Podcast is a production of the Texas Hill Country Podcast Network.